All right, everyone. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. All right. Well, I have the great privilege of introducing our opening speaker, um, and that is our District 4 Supervisor, uh, Warren Sokum. So let's give a round of a hand. Tangled up in the cord there. How is everybody? As they say in East Palo Alto, let's give one another a little love this morning. Thank you for being here. If you were coming to a movie, I'm sorry. There is no movie today. This is the second annual Immigrant Integration Summit. Uh, let me start by introducing a few of the elected officials that are here, if I could. Um, first, I'd like to introduce you to the Sheriff of San Mateo County, Carlos Bulanos, over here. <laughs> Deborah Ruddick from Half Moon Bay. I'm not sure if she's here. Okay. I know Donna Rutherford, uh, East Palo Alto, is here. I know that Juan Ragosa, our county controller, is here. And Ann Campbell, San Mateo County's very distinguished superintendent of schools. If I've missed any elected official, my apologies. Stand up, shout out your name, and we'll recognize you. Anybody that I miss? There's one over there. Can't see. Shout out your name. There we go. Another one back there. Hi, Georgia. Rob Solano from the Menlo Park Fire District is over to the left there. Thank you for being here, Sequoia. Yeah, hi, Anna. Anybody else? Okay, going once? That's it. All right. Once again, good morning, everybody. Um, this is the second annual Immigrant Summit. And let me just begin by thanking the historic Fox Theater for once again hosting the summit. Uh, you may not know this, but the Fox Theater opened its doors to the public in 1929. And since then, this place has become a major entertainment venue. And we should recognize and thank Ernie Schmidt and Nigel Paramund from the Fox Theater um, for their help in making this all happen this morning. Ernie, thank you. There he is. Of course, a thank you once again to all of you for being here, for dealing with the traffic, for getting up at zero dark 30, and uh, being here this morning. This is going to be a very, very special day. I want to start my remarks by reading uh, a quote, uh, an excerpt from the Los Angeles Times. It was a, an opinion piece, and it was written by a young DACA recipient. And uh, I felt this was moving and appropriate to share with you all this morning. And let me just read this quote to you. He wrote, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA, meant I could continue to pursue journalism, to keep telling stories about those like me, immigrants, Latinos, and LGBTQ community members. Since obtaining my work permit, I've worked at NPR, Marketplace, local radio stations, and now my hometown newspaper, the Los Angeles Times. He says, this brown kid from Mexico always dreamed of working at the Los Angeles Times. He said the paper, uh, that was the paper that he used when he was in middle school to complete his homework assignments. This September, another flurry of tweets and news alerts 
told me the Trump administration had announced it was ending DACA. I had known it was coming, just not when or how. It left me scared, confused, and anxious, as I had been all those years ago when my parents broke the news at the dinner table. Friends and colleagues texted me love letters and pledged their support that day. Some still continue to do so, and many ask one important question. What are you going to do now? He tells them, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. So I believe that the some 9,000 DACA youth in San Mateo County share a lot of those same feelings. Obviously, I've met with many dreamers. They've shared their stories, and I know that they um, share the thoughts that are contained in this editorial. And in San Mateo County, um, I think as a result of last year's summit, we've taken some real positive steps forward to support our immigrant community that I'll share with you in just a moment. As you know, last year was the inaugural summit, and it was geared towards learning about the immigrant communities in San Mateo County. I think many people were surprised to learn about the diversity of San Mateo County and how fast our immigrant population is, in fact, growing. We heard that a third of our population in San Mateo County were foreign-born. We also heard a range of perspectives from the immigrant experience. And we heard from all of you who were here last year about what's been going on on the ground in San Mateo County. So after our uh, gathering and getting the input from the attendees, the one issue, the one single issue that participants raised the most was the language barrier between residents, Latino residents, and San Mateo County. It turns out that not all of our services are bilingual, that wayfinding is difficult, and um, they, the attendees said, this was the number one problem that you all need to work on down at the county. Another issue uh, attendees raised was providing more free legal services to help our immigrant community. And finally, attendees expressed concerns that immigrants unfortunately did not feel welcome in San Mateo County. And if that doesn't break your heart, I don't know what will. As a result of that first summit, um, and over the course of this past year, my colleagues and I have begun to, to take on initiatives and adopt policies and laws to support our immigrant community here in San Mateo County. I just want to summarize a couple of those, those actions. In February of this year, my colleagues and I unanimously adopted a resolution to reaffirm the county's commitment to support and respect all community members regardless of ethnic or national origin, gender, race, religion, sexual orientation, or immigrant status. In March, my colleagues and I hosted a study session on possible actions that we could take to support the immigrant community. And from that study session came several uh, initiatives, and I'll just summarize those for you real quickly here. Supervisor Dave Pine and I uh, introduced a proposal which was approved by the board for funding of some $275,000, $275,000 to provide free legal workshops on topics including know your rights and path to citizenship, legal representation to immigrants, including survivors of domestic violence and abused and neglected children. I want to thank Supervisor Pine and my colleagues for their vote for $275,000 to support legal support for our immigrants. Uh, we also introduced a proposal to create the Office of Community Affairs, which would help link government resources and services to the underserved population and support the Office of Immigrant Support and Coordination. And I think the new director of that office is with us this morning. Her name is Emma Gonzalez, and I'd like to give it up for her. Is she here, Emma?
And finally, uh, our newest supervisor, David Canapa from Daly City and I introduced legislation which was approved by the board in June to create a countywide language access policy to ensure that all residents have equal access to programs and services offered by the county. And I want you to know that was in direct response to the, to the ideas that came out of this uh, conference last year. We also know that affordable housing Affordable housing is a big issue for not only our immigrant community, but for all of us. And this past May, my colleagues and I approved funding for some $43 million over the next two years to provide affordable housing. I think that's pretty remarkable. I'm also very proud to say that the county has continued uh, to provide uh, hosting for citizen workshops to help legal permanent residents move along the path to citizenship throughout the county. And I just want to tell you that uh, a couple of days ago there was one of these events in Daly City, citizenship workshop, and some 500 people showed up to get services and have the fees waived. Isn't that remarkable? 500 people? And as of yesterday, yesterday at the board meeting, uh, we adopted, um, thanks to Irving Torres, frankly, a resolution affirming the County of San Mateo's support for DACA and calling on Congress and the President of the United States to adopt a permanent solution for DACA recipients. Thank you, Irving Torres, for your leadership on that. As, as you all know, Congress has until December to pass the Clean Dream Act legislation to protect some 800,000 immigrant youth from deportation. This is a moral imperative, and it's incredibly popular with voters across the country. And we in San Mateo County want a community free of hatred and intolerance. Is that right? Let me just take a moment to acknowledge that some of all of this work was uh, supported and po made possible by the Office of Immigrant Support and Coordination. And that office is fairly new. It's something we started a couple of years ago, and actually two years ago, with a specific purpose of improving things for our immigrant community here in San Mateo County. And at the helm of that very important office uh, in the county is Jasmine Hartenstein, and so she's here somewhere, and if we could give it up for Jasmine, I want to. I want to just recognize her for her tireless effort, her resilient leadership, and her willingness to go above and beyond in assisting my office and the county and the residents of San Mateo County, uh, but especially the help she's given to our immigrant community. So. I think you can see that we've taken a couple of steps forward, but as usual, we have a long way to go. And that's what this Immigrant Immigration Summit is all about. It's trying to explore policies that will help create a better San Mateo County for all residents, for all residents, not just some. So thank you once again um, for being here. We do appreciate your attendance. Um, I'm really looking forward to this, the second annual integration uh, summit. I'm looking forward to hearing the policy recommendations that come from the work groups. Um, and I hope that you're energized about this conference also. It took a lot of work to get here today, and uh, that work is certainly recognized and appreciated. You're going to hear today from a variety of immigrants who are going to share their perspectives about their situation. You're going to learn about uh, the effect that policies have on our youth, and you'll learn about organizations and programs who are helping immigrant youth. I'm hoping that today's speakers and discussions will stimulate some interesting conversations at the tables, and hopefully this is going to lead for another set of to-dos for San Mateo County. In closing, uh, let me just say that uh, I want 
to thank our panelists for being here, for taking time out of their schedules. I'd like to share with you a quote from the late Robert Kennedy. He said, quote, few will, ha few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events, and in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. So are we ready to get started? Are we ready to get started? I'm going to introduce to you the first keynote speaker, who uh, is Professor Thomas Jimenez. He did such a good job last year that we invited him back for a second run here. And uh, let me just share a little bit about Thomas, if I could. He's an associate professor of sociology and comparative studies in race and ethnicity. He is also the director of the undergraduate program in comparative studies in race and ethnicity and director of graduate studies in sociology. His research, his research focuses on immigration, assimilation, social mobility, and ethnic and racial identity. Now, he's got a new book for sale. I don't know if he brought copies of it, uh, but I'm sure that he'll tell you how to get a hold of the book. And if all else fails, just go to Amazon.com and look for his new book, The Other Side of Assimilation, How Immigrants Are Changing American Life. That book focuses on the unique composition and atmosphere of three distinct areas in the Silicon Valley, right here. Um, <clears throat> Professor Jimenez analyzes the simulation from the perspectives of the region's established inhabitants by exploring how their lives have changed due to the presence of immigrants and interactions with them. Very important topics. Thomas is the father of two and holds got a lot of degrees here, so bear with me. Holds a BS in sociology from Santa Clara University, an AM and a PhD from Harvard uh, University. So let's give a warm welcome to Professor Jimenez. Thanks for that generous introduction. Good morning. <laughs> So I pace when I lecture uh, just to make my students a little bit seasick. Um, so my goal today, or my, my purpose for being up here, is to kind of set the stage a little bit. And if you were here last year, some of this might seem like Groundhog Day with data updated by one year. And I'm going to set the stage for us mostly demographically, that is describing the immigrant population nationally and, and here in San Mateo County. And I'm going to editorialize a bit along the way to say what I think the significance of, uh, of, these, of this demographic snapshot is. So I want to start um, by taking us back in time a little bit and start with a visual of just how important the immigrant population is to San Mateo County. So what you have here, although it's not rendering quite as well as I'd like, but what you have here uh, is San Mateo County, or, or uh, plus some, uh, divided up into its census tracts in the year 1970. And the upshot here is that the darker or the, or the more orange the census tract gets, I didn't pick the color, the computer program picks it for me, uh, the, the or, more orange the census tract gets, the larger the percentage of the immigrant population that lives here. So this is 1970, so what 1980 looks like, and you, maybe you can find your own census tract on there, is 1990, 2000, this is 2010, and then this is the period for which we have the most recent data. Anyone who lives here knows, I think, somewhat instinctively, but the numbers tell the story, or I should say the, the, graph tell, the graphics tell the story of an immigrant destination in full bloom. And in fact, it tells a story of an immigrant destination that is one of the largest in per capita terms uh, in the country. Uh, so about 13% of the population in the United States was born in another country. Here in San Mateo County, it's more than a third of the population was born in another country. Just south in Santa Clara County, it's almost 38%. Just to put this in kind of um, comparative perspective, um, we're approaching the percentage that, uh, that, was, that is foreign born in Los Angeles County, um, in New York City, larger than Chicago. So some of the kind of iconic immigrants 
immigrant gateways in the United States, at least at the county level, uh, uh, I would include San Mateo County. And if you were to add up the proportion of the population in San Mateo County that was born in another country or who has parents who were born in another country, you'd have a majority of the population right here in San, San Mateo County. Um, San Mateo County has an immigrant population that has grown less rapidly relative to the overall population than in the United States. However, San Mateo County has had a much larger immigrant population, so the growth looks less dramatic. But still, it's, it's fairly dramatic uh, in the last 25 years, having grown by more than 50%. Um, the region of origin. So in the United States, uh, the most recent wave of immigrants, what social scientists often call the post-1965 immigrants, so named for the year in which uh, we had a massive overhaul of our immigration laws that, for uh, in the interest of time, I'll keep it short, that allowed more immigrants to come from Asia in particular, but for a variety of reasons also spurred immigration from Latin America and particularly Mexico. So the overwhelming majority of the immigrant population today comes from Latin America uh, or Asia, and that's certainly true in San Mateo County. However, if you notice, I think, do I have a laser pointer here? There it is. However, if you notice, uh, the, the, um, uh, in, in the United States as a whole, Latin America dominates, whereas in San Mateo County, immigration from Asia tends to dominate. But nonetheless, these two regions are the ones that, that send the overwhelming majority of immigrants, with Mexico and China and San Mateo County um, leading, the country, leading as countries of origins. What about education? So it's often said that the United States attracts some of the most educated and wealthiest people in the world, and it also attracts um, some of the poorest and least formally educated people in the world. I know the difference between mal and bien educado, growing up in a me Mexican household, um, so I say least formal education. Um, so in the United States as a whole, about 30% of the immigrant population does not have a high school degree. We call those people, for lack of a better term, um, low-skilled immigrants. And then folks who have a bachelor's degree or more we call high-skilled, and those individuals constitute almost a third of the population in the United States as a whole. In San Mateo County, the quote-unquote low-skilled population is about a fifth of the population, but the high-skilled population is overrepresented relative to the United States, making up uh, almost 40% um, of the population here. Legal status. I want to dwell on this a little bit because I think it is probably the most important aspect of immigrant integration. So uh, among the immigrant population in the United States as a whole, about 4% of the population is unauthorized. That is, they either entered without inspection, uh, that has crossed through a port of entry without inspection, or overstayed a visa. Um, and uh, excuse me, 4% of the total population is unauthorized and about almost three in 10 are authorized. That's a number that's actually come down. Um, the, the numbers of unauthorized immigrants in the United States has come down recently. Um, and um, in San Mateo County, because we have uh, a larger share of the population that's foreign born, but also a smart, smaller population overall, the unauthorized population is about 8% of the total population. So 8%, not of the immigrant population, uh, but of the entire county population is unauthorized. That's a fairly large percentage, obviously more than uh, about double uh, the percentage in the United States, but the share of the overall foreign born population that is unauthorized is about one in five, and I dwell on this somewhat because legal status, I think, is, is the elephant in the room when it comes to immigrate, the discussion of immigration, but also when it comes to immigrant integration. I'll show you some research in a second, but it's suffice to say that there is nothing that prevents integration more than lacking legal status. And we have some good evidence for that, um, and, and I'll talk about that in a second with respect to DACA. So um, DACA, as, as you well know, um, is set to expire uh, sometime in March. Um, and overall, the overall uh, unauthorized population in the United States, almost a quarter is DACA eligible, uh, and about 15% is DACA eligible in 
um, in San Mateo County. And why is DACA so important? I, I want to kind of reframe the way we think about it a little bit. So DACA is really important as a legalization program, but I actually think one can think about it as a, as a mass uh, integration program. The United States does not have an integration policy. Uh, we have an immigration policy. We do not have an immigrant policy. We mostly, our policies mostly um, relate to who's allowed to come here, under what circumstances, who can stay, who has to go. And But once you come here, we're kind of hands off. Now, San Mateo County and a number of other uh, local jurisdictions are, are shining examples to the contrary that actually have an integration policy. And what we have found, I think, is, a, is that what we have now is a mounting set of social science that shows that when people have legal status, uh, it is good for their economic outcomes, good for their social outcomes, but it's also good for the outcomes of subsequent generations. Research that, that uh, I've been participating in with the Immigration Policy Lab at Stanford University, and you'll hear from Duncan Lawrence, the executive director, director later in the day, shows this and actually can prove that a program like DACA causes better outcomes, not just for parents, but for their children. So the Immigration Policy Lab, and this is, comes from a paper that was published in a recent edition of the journal Science, um, we had access to uh, Medicaid data from the state of Oregon. And this is the, I'm going to try and explain a natural experiment very quickly here. But um, you're DACA eligible if you were born on or after June 15th, 1981. So that's a cutoff. We think that the people who were born slightly before and slightly after are actually not all that different from each other, right? There's no, it's a kind of arbitrary cutoff date. And as for social scientists, that presents an opportunity to look at outcomes for people slightly before the cutoff date and slightly after and make some comparisons. So we had this Medicaid data, uh, and in particular emergency Medicaid data, Virtually all of the people who qualify for emergency Medicaid in the state of Oregon are unauthorized immigrants, and we wanted to look at outcomes for their children. What does it mean if your mother was born slightly after the DACA eligibility cutoff date or slightly before? What does that mean for your mental health outcomes? And here we have data on um, children with uh, adjustment disorder in the post and pre-DACA eligibility period. What this graph essentially shows that is if your mother is DACA eligible, you are much less likely uh, to, uh, your, as a child, uh, that is a U.S. born child, to have um, suffered from uh, adjustment anxiety disorder. Uh, and if your mother was born before the DACA eligibility cutoff, you are more likely. So that it registers in the mental health outcomes of children. And what's powerful about an experimental design, it's hard to do. Now we know the heart-rending stories of people who have DACA and people who don't, and those are powerful stories. And I think this is part of telling that story at a kind of more global level. We also have really good social science showing that um, for future generations, if your parents legalize, it benefits the children and even grandchildren of the, parent, of the, of the individuals who legalize it registers in um, their English language ability. Supervisor Slocum spoke a minute ago about people kind of wringing their hands about folks speaking English. Uh, so if their parents legalize, they're much more likely to speak English and speak English much faster. They have higher incomes, higher levels of education. It, it is a, legalization is a mass immigrant integration program, and I think that's an important way to frame it. Uh, in order to attract people who might be on the fence about whether they should support it. The unauthorized immigrant population is not the kind of uh, newly arrived folks who that, that we often have in mind, the people who just crossed the border or people who just overstayed a visa. In San Mateo County, they are fairly well settled, and their settlement, I think, shows up in their home ownership rates, for example. 23% of the unauthorized population in San Mateo County lives in owner-occupied housing. Uh, their time in the United States, sorry, my, my, uh, my, uh, this, these things are supposed to reveal themselves, if just to shock you or surprise you, and they're kind of revealing themselves out of order. It might, it might indicate my state of mind this morning. Uh, at any rate, uh, half of the unauthorized immigrant popu Im immigrants in San Mateo County have been here uh, for more than a decade. So they are, as many of you know, 
well-settled members of our community. Uh, they are working, 71% are employed. It just gives you a sense of how settled the population is. And so um, th there is a kind of disconnect between being well-settled but, but having legal status uh, that prevents somebody from experiencing full integration. <coughs> Speaking of integration, I just wanna lay out some principles of integration that, that I've gleaned from my own research and, and also from the research that other social scientists have done. So I wanna define integration for you, and I don't know if it's the, the definition that you'll accept going forward for this conference, um, but you should. Uh, it's when the characteristics of groups become more similar. So integration is not one group being absorbed by another. It's not one group losing everything they are to become like another. It's groups becoming more similar in their characteristics and their outlooks and their ways of life. That leaves open the possibility that the folks who've been here for generations change too. And I've done a lot of research on that. And as Supervisor Slocum mentioned, uh, I have two children. I also have a mortgage and I have a book available. So if you, uh, if you think about buying that, um, <laughs> I'm joking. I, I don't make any money off of these books. At any rate, um, the second thing is it takes time. We often have this notion, or you hear people have, have uh, talk about this idea that their, their immigrant ancestors came here from Europe. They got off the boat at Ellis Island. They picked up their American flag. And by the time they got to Battery Park, they were speaking English and reciting, uh, reciting the Pledge of Allegiance all the time. That's not true. It's never been true. It takes time. The idea of immigrant integration is a little bit of a misnomer. It really registers in the course of generations. It shows up in their children. It shows up in their grandchildren. Having said that, starting points really matter. And so to the extent that uh, immigrants in our community get off to a good start to the extent that they feel welcomed, to the extent that they are actually welcomed. Their, their children, their grandchildren will benefit, and I would argue so will we. That, and I've kind of made this point a second ago, but everyone is integrating. It's a multi-directional process. I don't think I need to dwell on that too much more, but it's often an unconscious process. It's something that uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Richard Alba says, it happens when people are making other plans. People are pursuing their economic opportunities. They want their kids to live in a better neighborhood. They want their kids to go to good schools. They want their kids to have a good job. And in that process, there are other forms of integration that are Unfold, more social forms of integration, not because people are trying to change who they are or lose who they are in some fundamental way, but it is often a byproduct of people pursuing their economic outcomes. And so I think that the goal of an immigrant policy, an immigrant integration policy of the sort that we have here is to help people make other plans. It's to help people pursue their educational uh, aspirations, it's to help people pursue their economic opportunity. And when we do that, the kinds of integration that people worry so much about will actually unfold on its own. And so I'll pause there 50 seconds early, according to the timer, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Irving, I do have time for questions, is that right? I don't know where Irving is. I think I have time for questions. Yep, Jasmine, sorry. Okay. Oh, right, yeah, sure. Sure, and I'll take another microphone. Any questions? <laughs> oh, good, okay, thank you, thank you. I was, I was, I was actually bruising my ego that nobody had come. Um, I know the last time you were here you spoke a little bit about um, the last time you were here, you spoke a little bit about law enforcement and their role. What do you think our role should be to continue assimilating, you know, the immigrant population in the community? Um, so uh, thanks for yeah. I remember I remember we we talked about this last time. Um, you know, things have changed a lot in the last year in in terms of the the role that um, local law enforcement plays. Um, you probably know the answer to the question better than I do, but you know, from a kind of outsider's perspective, from a social science perspective, I mean, the the work that you and your colleagues have always had to do to gain trust in, in immigrant communities is made even more difficult now by, by what's going on at the national level. And so whatever efforts you were making 
to make sure that um, immigrant popular immigrant communities know you, that they trust you. Uh, you have to double and even triple your efforts. And and you know, I, I'm I'm not saying anything earth shattering here. And and maybe if I do anything, it's just to to kind of applaud what I think you've been doing and, and emphasize what I think you've been doing, but um, but it creates a challenge in all kinds of ways. And so, and it's not just kind of more generally that what's coming out of the White House right now has a, has a kind of real life uh, effect on people, right? So policies can affect us in, in, in how we actually kind of go about our lives, but they also have tremendous symbolic value. And so I think integration policies and, and summits like this send signals about who belongs and who doesn't. And we've actually done some really good research showing this. Uh, and so people internalize with that. So, that, so when you, when you um, are loud about the fact that, that the county sheriff and the police department uh, in you know city of San Mateo, Redwood City, East Palo Alto, uh, want to earn the trust of the immigrant populations, it not only might have the effect of actually earning the trust, but it also sends a signal about who belongs here. And, and in sending that signal, I think what you, what you say is you belong here, you're a part of our community. Yeah, I don't have the microphone. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Do you I have a comment oh. regarding uh, integration and representation. And has there been any studies or academic research regarding that connection or causation between in integration and uh, representation, especially here in San Mateo County? Yeah, so the question about, you're talking about political representation? Yes, and local city government boards, just diversity. Yeah, um, so um, it is a, it's a form of integration that social scientists would, would measure. So um, uh, that is to say, you know, political integration would come in the form of citizenship, would come in the form of political participation, voting, uh, if people lack citizenship, uh, you know, writing representatives, showing up at city council meetings, marching, protesting, those are all kinds of forms of political participation, but the kind of, um, the kind of pinnacle of political participation is actually running for office and getting elected. Um, and so I, I know the re what the research says cross-nationally. Um, so if you compare the United States with our neighbors to the north, we're much slower uh, to integrate, uh, to, to find members of our immigrant communities elected in office. However, I think California as a state, so I can't say much about San Mateo County, but California as a state, I think in the last two decades has seen a tremendous growth of the children of immigrants being elected in office and the children of immigrants uh, enacting policies that I think make the state a more welcoming place for people like their parents. And because it was, for in many cases, their parents who lived through the 90s when California was, I think, unarguably the most anti-immigrant state in the country. And today, I think California is unarguably the most immigrant-friendly state in the country. And so in that one generation, that changed. There's a lot of reasons why it changed, but one of them is that the, the lawmakers who are enacting policies actually come from immigrant households. Um, uh, people like um, Kevin De Leon, people like Javier Becerra, and actually talk openly about the fact that their immigrant parents and their lives have shaped the way that they are, um, they're running the state. Maybe we have five seconds for maybe one. No, I, I, I'm being told no more questions. Oh, no more questions, okay. Sorry. I can stick around for like two seconds and answer more if you have some, but, um, but thanks for your attention, thanks for being here, and thanks for all the great work you do. Good morning. Buenos dias. How's everyone doing so far? Excellent. Beautiful. Folks, my name is Andres Connell. I'm the ED of a nonprofit in East Palo Alto called Nuestra Casa. We're a longtime supporter and, and uh, community member here in San Mateo County. And it's my pleasure to introduce the next speakers for today's event. Uh, we have a star studded field of speakers. And uh, it's just uh, fantastic to see young folks taking leads and really pushing the, the, uh, the barometer forward as it, as it pertains to immigrant integration. Our first keynote speaker is a fantastic young lady who hails from East Palo Alto, one of our very own. Um, so, Sarai Espinosa Salamanca is the founder and CEO of Dreamers Roadmap, 
a mobile app platform that helps undocumented students across the country navigate the necessary resources to, high, to achieve higher education. This is Sarai's latest project in a longer trajectory of activism within and for the undocumented community, which has placed her in the spotlight of continued conversations centered on national immigration policy. Sarai was a champion of change at the White House in 2014, has received two House of Representative awards, was named in Forbes 30 Under 30 for 2016, and most recently, um, uh, one was named 100 Most Powerful Women in Forbes, Mexico, 2017. She was also the recipient of the Otli Award, which acknowledges and celebrates the altruistic dedication and constant professional activities towards the empowerment and development of Mexicans abroad. This award is one of the highest and very limited distinctions given by the government of Mexico to distinguish individuals of Mexican or Latino origin. Um, a former undocumented student who once had to drop out of school to support her family, Sarai's personal experience informs her unwavering vision to help hundreds of thousands of students eliminate the barriers to success and achieve their full potential. So folks, if you could please join me and welcome Sarai Espinosa. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for waking up early and being here today. Um, so yes, my name is Sarai Espinosa Salamanca, and I'm going to be sharing a little bit of my story with you. Uh, I don't know where to point to make it go forward. Yeah, OK. Um, so I was born in Lázaro Cárdenas, Michoacán, Mexico. Um, and I came to Redwood City, California. So I was four years old when we migrated here with my family. Um, my sister was already living here for about five or six years. And I was moving from Redwood City to Los Angeles uh, with my mom. Uh, but I call Redwood City home because this is where I grew up. And it was, after I came back from high school to Redwood City, I found out that there was a lot of Michoacanos here. So then when I was telling people, oh, I'm from Michoacan, they're like, oh, you too? I was like, what is that supposed to mean? <laughs> and I later found out that there was a lot of us here, which is really cool. Um, so, like I said, so I graduated from high school in Los Angeles from North Hollywood High, uh, and I, because of my age that I got here when I was five years old, I very quickly went into kindergarten, picked up the language fairly quickly, uh, didn't have to go to ESL classes or anything, so I was never segregated or separated from my original class to indicate that I was any different from my classmates. But all of this changed my senior year of high school when I applied for FAFSA. Like all my friends were, I got a letter in the mail saying that I was denied because I didn't complete my application. I was missing the social security part. So I called my mom in Mexico, who had left when I was 16 years old, to please look for my social security number because I needed that to apply for FAFSA. And um, since I was very little, I remember my mom and I always documenting things. And I never knew why. I'm like, oh, she's just like really organized. So like all the little certificates that I would get or when we would go to the doctor or our, our letters with like our, our um, emergency, like Medi-Cal, like all of those little like letters were in this folder. And I'm like, mom, like look for it in there. It's probably going to be in there somewhere. Later, I found out that because I was undocumented, I was never assigned a social security number, or at least not yet, because I was still undocumented. So when I found out that I wasn't going to be eligible for FAFSA, I went up to my counselor, and I told her my situation. And I said, I still want to go to college. I'm the youngest of 11, first one in my family to graduate high school. And I wanted to be the first one to go to college. So she told me to come back in a week to see what she had found. Uh, and she found one scholarship, the Hispanic Scholarship Fund. But back in 2008, even that scholarship required a social security number or for you to be a legal resident. Uh, so I wasn't able to go to college right after high school uh, because of lack of information, because of lack of preparation, because I was the first one in my family to go to college. There was a lot of different obstacles that I faced. Um, and I remember my senior year of high school when this was happening, I thought to myself, I'm probably the only undocumented person in the country because nobody else is talking about this. Little did I know that there were about 65,000 students a year that go through this situation, and nobody was really focusing on, on helping us or finding solutions for us and bringing that information to our counselors or our teachers. So that when students like myself went up to them and exposed our, our status, we would get guidance and accurate information to potentially go to college right after high school. 
So I came back to the Bay Area after high school um, because I didn't know what I was going to do anymore in Los Angeles. I was kind of like in, in a stage of where I was figuring out what it meant to be an undocumented person, what my life was going to be after high school, not having documentation, not even to be able to work. But when I came back here, I, I quickly found out that there were opportunities for students like me. There were nonprofits in the Bay Area that focused just on finding scholarships for undocumented students, like the Bay Area Gardeners Foundation, the Chicana Latina Foundation, among others. Um, and I was eventually able to go to Foothill College the same year that I graduated, and that was thanks to a lady from my church, out of all places, um, who told me that her son was a counselor at De Anza and he would help students like me go to college. So for me, this was like a bittersweet moment because I was like, it's amazing that we can go, but it sucks that I can't no longer go to a four-year because it's too late. And, and then I thought to myself, well, how many other students are telling their counselor the same thing? And how many students are receiving the same answer that I got from this counselor? And as a country, we're losing potential. We're not educating these kids that are not going to go anywhere, right? This is our home. This is all we know. So might as well educate us to give back to this country. Um, and be valuable, right? And, and be able to give back. So I didn't apply for DACA until October. It came out in June because I didn't want to, honestly. I was afraid um, that I was going to be exposing myself literally to the government and telling them this is where I live uh, and, I'm, and I am undocumented. So it was thanks to my husband's family and their worst case scenario situation was, well, you'll get deported, you can go to our house in Sinaloa, and you can be an English teacher and you'll be fine. I'm like, well, ideally, I don't want to do any of that. I just want to stay, so that's why I don't want to apply. But as a worst case scenario, it could, be, it could be worse. So I, I applied. By January of 2018, I had my, um, my permit and my social security number, and I went back to school. I went to Cañada. And I started a blog where I would help undocumented students find scholarships to go to college. And in 2013, that same year, in the fall, I was one of 20 dreamers in the country chosen for, a, for the Forward.us Dreamer Hackathon with Mark Zuckerberg and other tech people here in the Silicon Valley. Um, I'm not a coder, um, so this was kind of one of my first challenges of getting myself into the technology world. Um, I had my blog, so I'm like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a tech person. I can, I, I can go to this hackathon. Um, and the requirements were, are you a dreamer? Are you very passionate about creating solutions for your community? And do you know how to code? So I was like, yeah, I have the first two, but I don't know how to code, but I'm going to apply anyways. So I applied, and I went through the interview process, and I was lucky to be one of the 20 people selected for this hackathon, and it changed my life completely. Because this was the first time in my life where I was surrounded by people just like me, as you see in the top picture. And until this day, it kind of hit me that I literally was not alone and that there were others just like me trying to fight for solutions, trying to figure out problems to our community, but through a very unique way, and that was through technology. So I left this hackathon very inspired to continue, oops, I might just skip that, uh, to create solutions for my community using technology. My first official job was with the Girl Scouts of Northern California as an environmental science and technology instructor. And because of my work at Girl Scouts and because of my work on my blog, I was invited to the White House in 2014 and I was honored as a champion of change. And I was able to go into the White House because I had DACA, because DACA gave me the opportunity to get my, my driver's license and you need a federal ID to get into the White House. So if I didn't have DACA, I wouldn't have been able to even get in the house to receive my recognition. In 2014, uh, another competition opens up from Voto Latino Innovators Challenge. And this was a competition open to anybody in the country who had a solution to a problem and that you had to solve it using technology. So I kind of had already been playing around with this idea for a couple years and I decided to switch gears. Um, my blog was online and I said, what if we make it into an app? And what if we make it national, right? Because my blog was just for um, San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Alameda County uh, students. So I pitched that. I went into, again, not a tech person, <laughs> went into this competition. Um, and I remember when I went to this competition, I made it to the top six, and I was in DC. And there were people walking around like right, like with their flashcards and people in like the lobby. And I was just sitting like eating a yogurt. And then I got really nervous, because I'm like, what if we got like a last minute email saying we had to do something, and I didn't see it? Um, but no, they were just practicing their pitch. And for me, I didn't feel the need to practice my pitch because my pitch was my personal story. I knew what I had to say. Um, 
And I was lucky enough that with my story and, why, and with my idea to create this app, I won first place in the country, so I came home with $100,000 to create Dreamers Roadmap. Yes. And I was also pregnant already here at, at this picture, so that's why um, I put that one up there after. <laughs> I was very pregnant. Okay, so uh, two years after I, f I, do, I finish Cañada, um, I get Antonio Villarraigosa to come and give me my second House of Representatives award along with the President's Award at Cañada. That is my baby. She was also born in 2015 and my husband. And this was the first event that I was, spoke, that I was invited to speak at right after um, coming back from Washington, D.C. And that's where I met Antonio Villarraigosa. In 2016, I graduated from uh, Stanford School of Business. I did an executive program for Latino entrepreneurs. So that has been kind of like my college education so far. And I also was named on Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2016, which was amazing. Um, to this day, I feel so proud that we have East Palo Alto um, on Forbes 30 Under 30. I don't know if I'm the only person to this date from East Palo Alto that has made it to Forbes 30 Under 30, but I'm just very proud to share it when I go to different places across the country and abroad um, that I made it to this list. Um, it's, it's an honor to be doing what I love and to be recognized uh, by such prestigious administrations like Forbes. And in April 13th, we launched our app. We are currently serving close to 16,500 students across the country. So we are very, very proud of that. Alicia Aguirre is there. I don't know if she's here right now, but a lot of people know her. Oh, she's teaching. Okay, awesome. She would. She's, a, she's the best. Um, she's on my board, so I'm very lucky to have her. And in 2017, so this year, uh, I won another award with Premios Juventud, and I was on Forbes 100 Most Powerful Women. And tomorrow, I'm going to be receiving the Otli Award. Uh, by the Mexican consulate, which is the highest honor that they give to Mexican uh, in el exterior, in the exterior, yeah. So I'm very, very, again, very humbled, very blessed to be doing the work that I love and to be receiving these recognitions that were definitely uncalled for. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. If you, if any of you have any questions or want me to talk about my app, the app's name is Dreamers Roadmap. Um, that's updated. Not updated. We have close to 16,500. <laughs> Those are all like the handles where you can get a hold of me. Our website is down here. Um, and if you want my email, Irving, you can search for him later and get it from him because I have to run to another event right now. Um, but thank you so much for being here. I, it makes me very, very happy to know that we have a whole community um, that cares about immigrants and dreamers and our success and that you guys accept us as citizens despite the fact that we don't have that acknowledgement on paper. So thank you very much. God bless you all and God bless America. Okay, folks, our second speaker today is another impressive young person who just keeps, this is a, a great list, it keeps getting better and better. Um, Diego Sepulveda is a fearless and relentless advocate for justice. Through his lifelong work, Diego has marched to the streets of this country and to the halls of the Capitol to advocate for LGBTQ justice, immigrant rights, worker justice, environmental justice, and college affordability and accessibility. Diego has been featured on ABC World News with Diane Sawyer, National Public Radio, KCET, Honor 41, Equality California's hashtag Health for All efforts, and with the California Museum through their We Are All California exhibit in Sacramento. In 2014, the city of Huntington Park awarded Diego as Community Leader of the Year. In 2016, the LA County Board of Supervisors presented Diego with a scroll to recognize and celebrate his courageous leadership. And most recently, this year, Diego was honored as one of 40 under 40 leaders by the Empowerment Congress, led by Assembly Member Sebastian Ridley Thomas and LA County Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas. Diego currently directs the Dream Resource Center at UCLA. He holds a bachelor's degree from UCLA and is currently an MBA candidate at the Graduate School of Nonprofit Management in Baylor, California. So folks, please let's welcome, warm round of applause to Diego Sepulveda. And before he comes on, we're gonna show a short video of some of his work. 
Finally, a young man determined to be the first in his family to get a college education, vaulting over the odds to do it. It's a story with a twist, especially in these political times. David Muir brings it to us. Ever since high school, I always knew I wanted to go to UCLA, but I never saw it as accessible or affordable or even just a possibility. Not even a possibility, he thought. And yet at 22, Diego Sepulveda is now a senior at UCLA. He says his parents work in sweatshops in East LA. He worked full time at Subway and at McDonald's to earn the money. All my money went to tuition and bucks. I was walking around hungry all the time. I didn't have clean clothes a lot of the time. I would wear the same thing for maybe three days. On campus, where most of us see labs and lecture halls, Diego also sees a place to sleep. When I didn't have a place to sleep or when I didn't have a place to go, I started staying in the dorm lounges and the library. Or he would come to this so student center. I would sleep on this couch. Going home means four buses and four hours. We've been on the bus and it's tiring. To that tiny apartment yes. where he grew up. My sister sleeps on this bed and my parents sleep on this one. This couch is where I actually slept. I love this couch. This couch is like my best friend. And out back? And we're going into what I call my backyard. We have a washer. We have to keep it outside because it doesn't fit in the apartment. Not afraid to show us where he comes from, Diego was also not afraid to reveal something else. He is one of those undocumented illegals we've all been arguing about. His parents moved him here from Mexico when he was just four. I can't receive any scholarships. I don't receive work studies. I just want to go to school. I just want to get my degree. Friends who've watched him work so hard now watch over him. A food pantry and a small room near school now offered to him rent free. I've never had half of the room, so this is just like an honor. And an honor, he says, aware his status is part of a national debate. No matter what, I'm going to finish UCLA, and I'm really, really, really um, optimistic about my future. An uncertain future, but so was the thought of college when he was young. David Muir, ABC News. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. How are we all doing today? Cool. So that was seven, seven years ago and a couple, of pound, a couple of pounds ago as well. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, it is such a pleasure and such an honor to be with you all today. Um, when I think of this video and really where we are currently in our country, um, I just feel like I filmed that yesterday, uh, where who I am and my identity and my lived experience uh, is still a national debate. And I think now more than ever needing to find a solution um, for people like me in this country and uh, the, uh, often the folks that are not thought of uh, when we think about immigration reform um, and in that context. Uh, I'm a storyteller, so I think I'll just start it off uh, with a little bit of a story. Um, uh, like I said, my name is Diego. Uh, I am a visionary waiting for a green light at the intersection of struggle and hope. I am a queer, formerly undocumented, first-generation Chicano College graduate. I am a soul-searching activist full of intersecting identities, wanting to break free from oppression and hate in order to be able to create the change I like to see in society. I was a role model for my then 14-year-old sister who dreamt of going to UCLA and who is now 20 in an incoming third year at, at UCLA. I fought my way through UCLA, thank you, and then breaking walls to be the first in my family to earn a professional degree, uh, to be part of the point two of 100 students that stayed in the, in the Chicano, Chicano educational pipeline to make it. Um, I am, though my brother dropped out of school because of his status, I am his dream for a fair and just society that triumphs education and opportunity for all. And because of all of this, I am with you today. I am thankful for the journey that brings me uh, to this conversation today because growing up I felt just like every student in my class, but I knew that I, uh, I knew that I was a little bit different. My mom would wake up in the morning five to be able to go work as a garment worker in a factory where every day she faced exploitation um, due to her status. Uh, where every day she would, wait ha she would have to wake up and go and um, uh, really break her bones to be able to, to be able to put. Uh, food on the table and come back home and be able to feed us, to be able to wash, um, to be able to do laundry and cook for us and really take care of us. Growing up, I knew the context under which I existed and I knew what it meant when ICE came to my aunt's doorstep 
to deport her husband, my uncle, ultimately leaving her as a single mother to raise my two cousins. As a child, my mom would tell me, be quiet, pretend to sleep. When we would drive home late at night in hypervigilance of the cops, always aware that our only means of transportation could be taken away, just like the previous times when we were left stranded uh, because my father did not have access to a driver's license. And I just mentioned all of this to drive home the fact that I am just one of a million people in this country. Uh, and that my story is one of resilience, one of power, but one of struggle and one of hope. Um, to say that one day we can get there, that we can bring justice uh, to our immigrant communities. Uh, and through the work of the Dream Resource Center and through my life, I've used storytelling as a, as, a, as a means to be able to communicate the importance of what it means to be able to fight for our communities. Because for me, uh, many, many of our stories in our community are rooted in a counter narrative that says that yes, we are worthy, that yes, we are valuable, and yes, we are beautiful, and that yes, we demand justice and dignity for everyone in this country, and that no, our identity is not illegal. No, we're not alien, and no, we're not second-class citizens. And no, we will not be silenced into the shadows any longer, because me existir es resistir. That my existence is resistance, and that our collective existence is resistance. I think now more than ever, I think we all realize that we are in this fight uh, together. And for us to be able to see each other, and to be able to collaborate and love each other and uplift each other's story is more powerful now than ever. I come from, uh, and I stand on the shoulder of giants and really a community that has fought for me to be able to have this platform today. Uh, it was immigrant young people in the state of California that mobilized for the California Dream Act um, to be able to say that we deserve access to an education um, and that the, the state of California has a role in that, in being, uh, supporting uh, and supporting us to be able to receive that education. Um, immigrant youth in the state of California have been at the forefront of the fight for health for all. Um, to say that undocumented Californians, and, uh, undocumented Californians should also have access um, to health care. And really in 2011, uh, we are currently in a fight to be able to bring a permanent solution, solution to immigrant young people in this country. But it was in 2011 at the UCLA Labor Center when Nady Dominguez convened other immigrant rights leaders uh, to be able to have a conversation about how we can move our communities forward, how we can move immigrant young people in this country. And that's where the idea of DACA happened. And it was immigrant young people across the country that launched the campaign to be able to fight for DACA. So a lot of times when, when we have this conversation, we say protect DACA not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it was by and for immigrant young people. And that we need to stand by immigrant young people and protecting something that they fought so hard to be able to receive. And in this current moment in time, continuing to push our elected officials and our, our organizations to allocate resources um, to be able to push for a Clean Dream Act, um, to be able to provide a pathway to citizenship for immigrant young people in, in, in this country. I have, I have a lot of friends who are becoming doctors and lawyers and directors and program officers uh, across this country, and, and the reality is that their lives are still in a limbo. And for me, when I, when I witness the struggle of our communities and the resilience, um, I know that we can do it. And I know that we can overcome the obstacles and the challenges um, that face us on a, daily, on, a, on a daily. And I think right now, as immigrant young people in the state of California have said for, for the previous years, um, that we will, cannot allow one more deportation, one more detention of our immigrant communities. Um, in this current moment in time, immigrant young people have been saying not one more, not one more deportation for people like my uncle who was deported eight years ago. Um, because what we're talking about is separation of families. And to say that love is love, that uh, you should be able to love whoever it is that, that, that you want and health for all, to be able to say that undocumented communities should have, have access um, to health care and education and not deportation. That should, you should invest in our education and not deport us a lot of times to countries that we, that we don't know. And for me, it's such a privilege and it's such an honor to currently direct the Dream Resource Center um, because it's a center by and for immigrant young people where we engage in leadership development, research, policy, 
um, to be able to move uh, immigrant youth forward. Uh, we launched in 2011, after the failure of the Federal Dream Act, we launched Dream Summer, which is our national fellowship program for immigrant youth and allies. In 2010, uh, right after this video aired and the Federal Dream Act uh, failed, immigrant young people sat around the table and had a conversation about how we would be able to sustain the immigrant youth movement to continue building power, continue building agency, and continue telling our stories in order to achieve justice for our communities. And from that dream summer came about. Um, it's a national social justice fellowship program for immigrant young people where eight weeks they work on immigrant rights issues on various intersections. I'm um, talking about what does it mean to be undocumented and a mujer, a woman? What does it mean to be undocumented and LGBT, um, undocumented and live in a toxic community where um, where the air and the soil that you walk on, um, the air you breathe, the soil that you walk on um, every day pollutes you. Um, so we use immigrant rights as a framework to be able to empower young people across the country um, to fight in their local communities for the things that they believe in. Uh, since 2011, we've now built our base of over 600 Dream Summer alumni across the country. We've partnered with over 200 social justice organizations to be able to make it happen, and we've fundraised over $3.5 million um, to give each of our 600 uh, fellows a $5,000 leadership award that they can apply to their education or, or whatever needs that they have. And in 2016, we launched uh, the Silicon Valley cohort within Dream Summer to be able to address the socioeconomic um, disparities in the area, specifically when it comes to immigrant young people and the immigrant community. And we were able to make some policy recommend recommendations there. Um, for, for me, so thank you. And currently, some of the things that we're working on is uh, launching our immigrant, our, our immigrant Justice Fellowship, uh, which is going to place six immigrant young people across the state of California in Orange County, Orange County, Inland Empire, Los Angeles, Sacramento, Silicon Valley, um, to be able to engage in rapid response work and meet the needs of our immigrant communities in this current moment in time. Um, we've launched an undocumented stories exhibit to continue uplifting the narratives of immigrant young people, of unaccompanied minors in their fight for justice, for freedom, uh, for healthcare, um, for education. And um, just recently, we partnered with the American Feder Federation of Teachers to develop curriculum around our three publications, uh, Dreams Deported, Underground Undergrads, and um, uh, so Underground Undergrads, Undocumented, Unafraid, and Dreams Deported, to then, uh, to then be able to go into high schools and be able to uh, teach young people about the resilience of their community and the power and the beauty um, that they have in this current moment in time. Uh, so if I could leave any message uh, today um, or get you to think about something, it's what's San Mateo's County's role in being able to address the issues that our immigrant youth and our immigrant communities are facing. But if there's anything that I know is that our communities, our immigrant young people are powerful, um, that they are beautiful and that they are resilient and that who we are in this country matters and that we have worth and that we have value and that every single day we will continue to advocate for our communities because we believe in justice and we believe in dignity and we believe in respect and we believe in our basic human rights and our basic human necessities. And that every day when young people wake up and we fight, we fight not only for us, but we fight for people like my parents. We fight for people like my aunt. We fight for people like my uncle, and that every single day we are committed to the movement. So I invite you to join us in our efforts um, to continue building and build a community of power and of beauty. So I thank you very much for your time. Well, let's keep it going. How about another round of applause for Sarai and for Diego? Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. All right, folks, we'll have a 10-minute break. Go get some coffee, some juice, some pastries, and we'll see you back here for the first session at 1020. <laughs>